So this conversation seems to be presupposing God as creator. And I realize that uh, since God has created, that is the context we're living in, so that makes sense. But then how do we, uh, is there some way that we can determine that that mm -hmm. is indeed the situation? Mm -hmm. Sure. So everybody heard that question, right? So the, um, the issue is that you can only, your most basic assumption you cannot prove directly. Directly. Which is to say, if I was to say to you, Jesus is the Son of God, you could say to me, how do you know that? And I would say, well, <laughs> Scripture testifies that Jesus is the Son of God. How do you know Scripture is true? Well, we've got this archaeological evidence, and we know from the authenticity of the New Testament text, and we've got the testimony of the church, and we've got the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, and we've got miracles. Yeah, but how do you know that, you, that those things really happened? I mean, can you be certain, absolutely certain, about the authenticity of the text? And you cannot have an infinite regression to the point, because if I, everything that I establish my next assertion with is more basic than my previous assertion, right? So if I establish the divinity of Christ on something more basic than the divinity of Christ, then what I'm establishing his divinity with is my foundation. Now, you cannot have an infinite regression of foundation. That's why faith lies behind every philosophy, a faith commitment, a religious commitment. How we know from a, an apologetic standpoint, from a philosophical standpoint, the truth of our position is that without it, if you deny our foundation, human experience is rendered unintelligible. So you can have, somebody can say, well, I prefer an unintelligible human experience. I prefer to make nonsense of human experience. Well, nobody lives like that. So, I mean, I remember when I was doing, a, I was speaking at Oxford, um, and I was doing this big apologetics event. There were hundreds of Oxford University students in the room, and I gave this apologetic for Christ. I finished, and a student came up to me, and he started getting into this question with me about truth and so on. And I said, well, our conversation right now, I can't remember his name, is presupposing all kinds of laws. It presupposes that truth transcends our minds. It's presupposing that what is going through your mind, if there is such a thing as mind, because in your worldview I said there's only brain, there's no mind, uh, that what's going through your mind is communicating through your words to me. And that presupposes the, of the function of language, of signs. And that the, so there is a law for the lingual aspect of our conversation. And you want my responses to be rational, so you're presupposing logical law. So how can you have those on your worldview, on a materialist worldview, where there is no law, where there is no God, where there's no design plan? So uh, a presuppositional approach to the apologetic task says that we don't establish the authority of Scripture or the divinity of Christ directly. We believe that by faith. The and that's why you don't find you know, arguments in the Bible that you would find in a you know, Thomas Aquinas' five ways of you know, establishing the existence of God, you know, movement and so forth. God doesn't offer those kind of arguments. The challenge of the Christian message, of the Christian faith, is if you deny Christ and the Word of God, try and make sense of human experience. Try and retain knowledge, language, truth. It can't be done. You just, by reductionism, by taking an aspect of creation and trying to put that in the place of the Creator, they destroy the very thing they're trying to defend. They want their science, your colleagues would be physicists, they want, their, they want their physics, so they want mathematical law and they want to be able to write about it, so they need lingual law, and they want spatial law and, and physical law and so on. But their worldview, if it denies the living God, denies them the possibility of physics, or denies the intelligibility of the project of physics. So the, that's, it's an indirect proof, I would say. Right? It's, it's, that's the, what you're talking about is the trans, philosophers would say the transcendental conditions for knowledge. Even having the conversation with them about it presupposes a whole set of transcendentals that their worldview cannot justify, cannot support. Where to stand? Where's the lever? You know, they're inside of their boat, right? trying to press down on physics to try and get going. But they've got nowhere to stand. They can't move forward. They've reduced reality to the physical aspect. Does that make sense? 